All right, so um, our last lecture of the year, Events of the Vietnam War, Part 2, we're going to talk about bringing Vietnam to a close through the last couple of presidents that dealt with Vietnam. Up to this point, we've discussed how Truman started us off with financial aid, right? Helping the French to fight against Ho Chi Minh and his army. Eisenhower took us militarily to Vietnam in putting in a couple hundred advisors. Kennedy upped that number to thousands of advisors based on the fact that the war wasn't going very well for the South. And then Johnson took the step of Americanizing the war. We talked about that in the last set of notes and in the last chapter of the textbook. Johnson Americanizes the war and makes it ours. Um, so we're going to pick back up with this sort of continuing set of notes here um, by talking about President Johnson after he has sent in hundreds of thousands of American troops. In a lot of ways, and so your outline is basically just, you know, just bullet pointed under each of the different presidents <coughs> we're going to discuss here, and then finishing with some lessons that we perhaps could take away from Vietnam, or that are still being debated today. Um, with President Johnson, one of the, the issues that weighed heavily on him was the, the matter of public opinion, right? He wasn't wild about the Vietnam War. He really wanted to focus on the great society, but he really couldn't figure out how do we, how do we win the war or at least get to a peace settlement without making it look like we're cutting and running. Johnson does a fairly good job for a while of keeping public support for the war relatively high. He's able to kind of sell the American people on the need for being there. But as we know, the longer the war continues the more people are starting to turn against it. So if you think back to the movie we watched, right? The protests at the Pentagon start with the one guy who burns himself on the wall outside of Bob McNamara's office. Then you had a smaller gathering. Then you had a larger protest. So more and more people are turning against Johnson and his handling of the war. The turning point, though, for the war, I think a lot of historians would say, not in a military sense, but in a public opinion sense, was the Tet Offensive. We read about this in the book. Tet is a national holiday in Vietnam. It marked the start of the Lunar New Year. And traditionally, because remember, this fighting has been going on for years now, traditionally, both sides would acknowledge a ceasefire. Cease is C E I S E, a ceasefire.
They would call off the fighting for a set period of time, and kind of go, armies would go back to their homes to celebrate this holiday. Knowing that this was happening, the NVA, the North Vietnamese Army, and the Viet Cong use it to launch a surprise attack all across the South. So the Tet Offensive wasn't just one surprise attack on a base or on a city. This was a coordinated surprise attack all across South Vietnam. They attacked major cities. They attacked U.S. bases. They attempted to start an uprising in the countryside. This was the Viet Cong. In the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army. Okay. So they attempted to um, start riots in in the countryside, right? So, so the the armed forces are while they're attacking different strongholds, different bases. You had Viet Cong forces in the countryside trying to stir up a rebellion. Because remember how we talked about there were a lot of South Vietnamese who weren't wild about the U.S. and the and the, and the South Vietnamese government. So they're trying to stir that up. Perhaps the best known fighting of the Tet Offensive was in the capital city of Saigon. Saigon was the South Vietnamese capital. And in Saigon, Viet Cong forces actually busted into the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. And so I've got a couple short video clips uh, in this presentation that I want to show. The first one is um, has some primary source footage but actually has uh, um, someone talking a little bit about this Tet Offensive. Is it possible to win a battle and lose the war? I'm Jim Lindsay, and this is Lessons Learned. Our topic today is the Tet Offensive, which began in late January 1968 and changed the direction of the Vietnam War. U.S. and South Vietnamese troops are hoping for a break from the fighting, during that final week of January 1968. It was Tet, the beginning of the Lunar New Year, a time of great celebrations in Vietnam. In previous years, both sides had been <coughs> on fire to allow the country to celebrate its national holiday. But unbeknownst to the Americans and the South Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, the communist rulers operating in South Vietnam, had infiltrated towns and cities across the country. As the festivities for Tet began, they struck with ferocity hitting targets like the Saigon International Airport, the Presidential Palace, and even the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. After the initial surprise wore off, U.S. and South Vietnamese forces responded with devastating effectiveness, repulsing the attackers and inflicting huge losses. The Viet Cong were broken as a military force for the remainder of the war. But while the United States military scored a victory on the battlefield at Tet, the effect at home was quite different. The fighting at Tet helped turn American public opinion against the war and persuaded Lyndon Johnson not to run for re-election. The discrepancy between what happened in Vietnam and what happened at home has generated a slew of books and articles arguing that the news media's coverage of the Tet Offensive turned the American public against the Vietnam War. To be sure, journalists got a lot of the facts wrong early on in the Tet Offensive. 
most famously, journalists reported that the Viet Cong had invaded the U.S. Embassy, when in fact they only managed to get onto the embassy's grounds. Many Americans were horrified to see a photo of a South Vietnamese Army general summarily executing a Viet Cong prisoner on the streets of Saigon. But the talk of how journalists covered the Tet Offensive misses the broader point. Context matters. Even before Tet, the American public had begun to sour on the Vietnam War. Polls done in the middle of summer of 1967 showed that the majority of Americans had concluded that the decision to become involved in Vietnam had been a mistake. The Johnson administration responded to these poll numbers by launching a public relations campaign to build support for the war. That included bringing home the commanding U.S. general from Vietnam, who told the American public that an important point had been reached where the end begins to come into view. I am absolutely certain that whereas in 1965 the enemy was winning, today he is certainly losing. Tet shattered the claim that the United States was making progress in South Vietnam. Americans began talking about a credibility gap because the Johnson administration had violated a cardinal rule of American politics, never overpromised and underdelivered. Preparing the public for a setback and reversal is critical to succeeding with any foreign policy that requires a sustained political commitment. That lesson is worth keeping in mind as we talk about a potential military strike against Iran or intervening militarily in Syria. The American public will bear great burdens, but it wants to know what the costs are before the fighting begins. I invite you to join me in continuing the conversation at my... That's where we that. Um, so, Tet militarily was a disaster for the Viet Cong. The U.S. Army hit back fiercely and inflicted significant losses onto the Viet Cong. From a purely military standpoint, even though we were caught off guard, we fought back and won a military victory. But it largely didn't matter. Because the importance of Tet is not that we won a military victory, it's that we took a psychological loss. Right? We took a loss when it came to public opinion. This chart right here, which comes out of our textbook, shows that very literally, graphically. Okay? Johnson's approval ratings. Prior to the Tet Offensive, not great numbers, but not outside the realm of fairly normal. Close to 50%, <coughs> about 47% approval rating. Afterwards, it takes a massive drop down to about 36%. 36% ain't good when it comes to presidential approval ratings. How many people approved of his handling of the war? About 38-39% prior to Tet drops down to about 26% following the Tet Offensive. So while we could stand there and say it was a military victory, we're close to winning, when American people turn their, their TV <coughs> sets on and they see our embassy under attack, when they see uh, cities across South Vietnam in flames, it certainly doesn't look like we're winning. So Johnson's credibility takes a hit. Johnson's um, approval rating and his handling of the war takes a hit. And why does that matter, right? Why is public opinion so important? Well, when it comes to fighting a war, public opinion is going to influence how much the public is willing to sacrifice to support the war. Public opinion is going to influence 
how much people are willing to sacrifice to support the war. If the public is behind the war effort, they will make personal and financial sacrifices. Right? Think back to when you studied World War II. People were willing to abide by rations. They were willing to perhaps give a little more in taxes because they supported the war effort. People are not going to be willing to do that, to pay higher taxes, right? to support the war effort, to serve in the army. If, if the public support isn't there, the public opinion isn't there. So facing this growing public opposition to the war, President Johnson announces that he will not seek re-election in 1968. Right? Really shocked the public, shocked even his own close advisors when he announced he would not seek re-election. So we saw the video clip from the movie we watched, but um, I want you guys to see the actual clip from his, uh, his press conference as well. And this is actually Johnson here. And that's Lady Bird, his wife. When America's son feels <coughs> far away, with America's future under challenge right here at home, with our hopes and the world's hopes for peace and the balance every day, I do not believe that I should devote an hour or a day of my time to any personal partisan causes or to any duties other than the awesome duties of this office, the presidency of your country. Accordingly, I shall not see and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Kind of drops that one in there, and all of a sudden that, that throws open the election of 1968, which is won by this guy, Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon's a Republican. He comes in, and he actually um, begins the process of uh, trying to end this war. Here's a campaign ad he ran. Never has so much military, economic, and diplomatic power been used so ineffectively as in Vietnam. If after all of this time and all of this sacrifice and all of this support, there is still no end in sight, then I say the time has come for the American people to turn to new leaders, <coughs> not tied to the policies and mistakes of the past. I pledge to you, we shall have an honorable end to the war in Vietnam. This time, vote like your whole world depended on it. There's a good uh, glittering generality for you there. Okay. So Nixon campaigns to bring the war to an end. And when he is elected, he begins the process of what is called Vietnamization, which is kind of a clunky word, but is exactly what it sounds. If Johnson Americanized the war, then Nixon takes the step to Vietnamize the war which simply means the process of withdrawing U.S. troops and handing the responsibility of fighting the war back to South Vietnam. Say that again. Vietnamization, 
withdrawing U.S. troops and handing the responsibility for fighting the war back to South Vietnam. Now that doesn't mean we 100% just up and left overnight. Okay, we're still there, but we start to take troops out, and our involvement starts to shift. My other picture in there, where am I? From ground forces to more bombing raids. So it's almost like we've we, we, we've gone up and down. We started with bombing, then we moved to ground forces. Now we're taking away those ground forces and increasing our bombing. Nixon sent some of his aides several times to conduct peace talks with the North. And several times those peace talks failed. And they kept falling apart over one key issue. The bombing. Nope. They kept falling apart over the issue of sharing the North, sharing power with the South. Nixon wants to get out of Vietnam, but he wants to leave the South as an independent democracy. Right? He wants kind of what we ended up with in Korea, right? where you, you had a settlement where you had a North Korea and a South Korea, and the South stayed democratic. That's kind of what he, he's hoping to get in Vietnam. Right? The communists can keep the North, the South will be its own country, and will stay democratic. And the North ain't having it. <coughs> Excuse me. So the peace talks break down a couple of times. Meanwhile, public opinion continues to build against the war. And there are a couple of really important events, some of which you read about last night. One of those was the May Lai Massacre. Now, May Lai looks like my leg. Okay, but it's pronounced May Lai. The May Lai Massacre. In the May Lai Massacre, U.S. soldiers basically slaughtered an entire village of Vietnamese and then attempted to cover it up. So you guys went to a village and killed... And basically just wiped out the village. Men, women, children. And then... And then some of the people involved attempted to cover that up. However, photos and news reports got out and absolutely shocked the American public. Right? Remember how we talked about, really, this was arguably the first war to, to, to be broadcast live, right? And these images are going into people's televisions every night. Another major event that added to this growing public opposition was the Kent State shooting. This image was in your notes last night. Very famous image. Kent State is a college 
And colleges were, colleges and universities were, were a lot of times centers for protest, right, against the war. And at Kent State, one of those protests, you had armed National Guardsmen who were sort of squared off against protesting college students, and things got out of hand. The guardsmen opened fire and killed several students. Yet another event that led to more outrage, more public opposition to the war. In 1970, President Nixon authorized bombing and invading a neighbor of Vietnam, Cambodia. One of you actually mentioned yesterday when we looked at a map, you said, hang on, why we, we attacked Cambodia? The North Vietnamese had been using supply routes that went through Cambodia in order to get around the U.S. and bring guns and ammunition into the South. To try to cut off those supply routes, Nixon actually authorizes an attack on Cambodia. And hid that from the public at first. Right? Did not let the public know that that was going on. Good question. What did Congress allow the president to do to with the Gulf of Tonkin resolution? To do whatever they feel necessary. Okay. So, in the notes, I can't remember if it's the one you read last night, but I think it's the one that you're going to be reading tonight. It talks about the War Powers Act and how Congress is going to go, yeah, actually, that kind of backfired on us. We're going to kind of undo that a little bit. So, you'll be reading about how Congress takes that power that they probably never should have given in the first place and, and starts to take it back. In 1973, which is still under President Nixon, the U.S. finally signs a peace agreement called the Paris Peace Accord. What year is that? 1973. The Paris Peace Accords. Under the terms of the Paris Peace Accords, there would be a ceasefire between the two sides. U.S. troops would be withdrawn from Vietnam.
and U.S. POWs, prisoners of war, would be released. So Nixon does effectively bring U.S. involvement in Vietnam to an end, which he was he campaigned on that. Now, once U.S. troops are withdrawn. What do you think happened next? They started fighting again. They started fighting again. Right? That ceasefire didn't last very long. Okay. The U.S. withdrew, and then shortly afterwards, fighting started up again between the North and the South, but this time without U.S. involvement. So Nixon gets the U.S. troops out of there, but the war itself does not come to a close. It continues just without U.S. involvement. And that brings us to the last president to deal with the Vietnam War, Gerald Ford. Now in our next chapter, we'll, we'll study more focused on the U.S., how we ended up going from Nixon to Ford, which is a fascinating story in and of itself. It's led to the only person to be president who was never elected to the executive branch. So we'll get into that. But, for right now, just know that Gerald Ford comes after Richard Nixon. All right, and Ford, the troops are already withdrawn, but he's still monitoring the situation, right, of what's going on in Vietnam, and in April of 1975, the North finally overruns the South. And Vietnam fell to communist control. Perhaps one of the most famous images of the war is this one here of in 1975 when communist forces were basically outside the, the borders of Saigon bearing down on the capital city. Um, for, for a lot of people, this is one of the lasting images of our involvement in Vietnam, right? A disorderly evacuation of American personnel trying to get out before the city fell. Okay. And I think for a lot of Americans, the question remained at that point, why? Right? Like, this is what it came down to. Half a million men there at one point. Over 50,000 Americans killed. And, and this is what it came to. Right? Why? So that... Brings us to our last point we're going to talk about, and then we're done. And this is something still debated today, so that's why I've got a question mark on the end there, right? It's not like, oh, here are the lessons, write them down, right? We're not really fully sure. Historians debate the, the significance of Vietnam and what we should learn from it. So rather than saying, here's the things that we learned, I'm just going to throw out some questions that have, that, that have come up that are continue to be debated today, okay, um, that, that, that Vietnam sort of threw these questions out there. We're still talking about them. First off, how informed should the public be about what the military is doing? 
Vietnam raised that question, right? How much of a right to know does the public have? Kind of related to that. Should there be restrictions on the media during periods of war? Is it reasonable to put some restrictions on freedom of the press during periods of war? Wait, what was that? Should there be restrictions on the media? Should we restrict freedom of the press? Right. Certainly in Vietnam, the media at first was kind of talking about the, the heroism, the patriotism, and then it started turning more and more negative. Right? It says, well, okay, well, yeah, the people, the people should know some things, but, but how much is too much? Right? At what point does it become maybe a threat to our military operations? Like when someone's getting shot in the head, right? Well, again, these are the questions that have, that have come up. How much, another question, how much of a voice, how much influence should military leaders have over foreign policy decisions? How much influence should military leaders have over our foreign policy decisions? Obviously, they're an important voice. How much sway should they have? Right? Think back to the video we watched and how, how much influence the Secretary of Defense had, even though he wasn't, he was he himself was not a military guy, he was the head of the Department of Defense. Right? The generals had a lot of influence. How much should they have? And one that we're still grappling with, certainly today. To what extent should the United States involve itself in other countries' affairs? To what extent should the United States involve itself in other countries' affairs? So there aren't clear-cut answers to those. Different people have different opinions that could be equally valid. Some will say, right, like Johnson did, we're the only superpower left, right? We have a responsibility to defend freedom and democracy around the world. Others will say we should learn from Vietnam that we can overextend ourselves and get bogged down in things that we have no business getting bogged down in. These aren't clear-cut answers, all right? But there are certainly important decisions, uh, that, that important questions that have to be considered. And I think if we look back at Vietnam, we can, we can learn some lessons there. Okay? 